This session is going to be, it'll begin with a keynote address by uh, Secretary of State Fyodor Naimsky, and then that will be followed by a panel discussion. You can see the bios, you can read them, but with Colin Clary, uh, Director for Energy Diplomacy for Europe and Western Hemisphere in Africa at the State Department, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Andrea Waldman Lockwood of the Department of Energy, similar region for Africa, Middle East, Europe, and Eurasia, Office of International Affairs. The commenter will be the inimitable, amazing, multifaceted Edward Lucas, <laughs> and I'm just going to hang on for the ride. <laughs> we have from 12.30 until 1.40. I'm really excited to, to, to hear these remarks, to hear my, if I may say, my dear friend, uh, Secretary of State Naimsky, who, as I said offhandedly uh, during the last panel, is truly one, one of my personal heroes uh, in transatlantic relations. He's it's not in his bio, he's too uh, probably uh, humble to put it in there, but uh, is one of the fathers of the Solidarity Movement, and way back in 1976, you were supporting the intellectuals in the very beginning. Of yeah, I am old enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was really, I mean, the, the very early days of what became Solidarity, when finally the intellectuals rose up uh, after the workers and the peasants had, and to make a long story short, in four years we had Solidarity. <laughs> Uh, he's now Secretary of State and the Chancellor of the Prime Minister of Poland for Energy Infrastructure. Um, he's yeah, an academic, as I just said, opposition activist. Uh, I met him when he was in exactly the same office 14 years ago uh, and was conceptualizing what became the Polish policy, which is helping Poland to diversify its own supplies of natural gas and make sure there are no, no devious molecules flowing in from Russia by developing its own upstream resources on the shelf of Norway and then building uh, a dedicated pipeline system to Poland. So, Mr. Secretary, please. Uh, may I stay, stand yeah, aside? Yeah, because you to see what uh, all right. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I think that uh, we are discussing today a very important issue, which is not uh, necessarily that, uh, I mean, linked only with the uh, gas supplies. Uh, I, oh, what's there? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what I, uh, what I would like to say is that uh, at the beginning, that um, I really appreciate what uh, uh, three speakers uh, uh, at the previous panel said, because analysis given by uh, Vladimir Sokor and, uh, and Mrs. Asieva and, and Matthew, uh, okay, I, I thought, you know, during the lunch uh, what I uh, should say. Uh, I have uh, several maps, uh, I mean, a few maps I would like to show them to you, uh, in a sense, uh, 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 adding uh, some, uh, let's say, visual uh, uh, message to, to what was said. Uh, you see, uh, our, let me, let me start with a few words about the title of uh, our meeting today, which is Future of Baltic Energy Security. This is, of course, a much wider uh, problem than gas supplies to the, to the region. And just to remind where we are, you know, Baltic is a, uh, is a very um, small sea. Uh, many people uh, think that it's uh, even not the sea, but uh, just the Gulf. Uh, and uh, the access to Baltic, uh, it's uh, very difficult, you know, the Danish Straits, you know, they are uh, difficult to pass by, by tankers and, uh, and uh, liquid LNG, uh, LNG ves vessels. You have here, you know, these uh, routings, you know, the major route, route goes from uh, Russia, and this is uh, routing for oil exportation uh, uh, Russian oil exportation toward, toward the uh, global, ma global market. Uh, the problem is that just in case of crisis, you know, it's rather for uh, our military colleagues to be, to be considered, but anyway, 
it might be not easy to access uh, uh, Baltic from outside or to leave Baltic. Uh, and uh, and I okay with and 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 if we are thinking about oil supply, crude oil supply to the region, or to Poland specifically, uh, we we are on a I mean theoretically on a good position because we have uh, uh, oil terminal in Gdańsk and. Uh, we are able to 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 receive uh, from this uh, source from this uh, uh, gate uh, enough oil for other refineries. Uh, our refineries are using uh, majority what they use comes from uh, Russia, still because we have uh, I mean old pipeline oil pipeline coming from the, from the east, uh, about 70% of, uh, uh, of the oil pro uh, processed in Poland comes from the east and they are working on diversification of, uh, of uh, those uh, um, supplies uh, using, uh, as I said, using this Gdańsk uh, uh, terminal. Uh, and this is relatively safe because once, you know, there are they could be troubles with supplies from the east. They can be replaced by, uh, I mean, 100% replaced by uh, deliveries uh, uh, by ships, uh, by tankers. So, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, in practice uh, uh, for daily routine, this is safe. In case of major crisis, it might be a real problem. Electricity. Uh, you see, Balt Balt I, I mean, uh, states uh, uh, lying on Baltic Sea, because Baltic states is uh, misleading. Uh, uh, very recently, actually, it's going on. We came uh, into uh, agreement with uh, uh, Baltic states TSOs on synchronization of uh, the uh, Baltic states with the European energy system because so far they are linked still to the old post-Soviet uh, uh, system. And uh, the idea of uh, synchronization uh, is a very old one. Uh, you know, it was started 10 years or um, more, 14 years ago, and uh, went through a um, series of obstacles. And uh, finally, we did sign on a political level uh, in June, agreement between those three countries and Poland. And uh, now Polish TSO applied formally to NCOE, in, uh, which is uh, Organization for European TSOs, uh, in charge of uh, such a move like uh, synchronization uh, a new country. Uh, so uh, Polish TSO applied formally for synchronization of three Baltic states, and scenario for this synchroniza synchronization is being uh, agreed, which was once again not an easy point because, and this is probably uh, could be interesting for you, uh, we were pressed by some uh, colleagues or people, I would say rather, from Baltic states to build another AC line from Poland to Lithuania. The first one previous is, uh, ex uh, I mean, already exists, is operational, so-called Litpol. Okay, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm not touching it. <laughs> so, uh, so-called, uh, 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 you know, uh, Litpol One, which is uh, which is in place, and they press us to build another such a similar line, uh, and we uh, really objected because uh, why? Because it would be easy way for energy produced, generated in Kaliningrad in Russia or Belarus or, or further down uh, to, the, to the east in Russia. So uh, easy gate for this energy, unwanted energy to European market, I mean Polish and European market. Just, uh, and uh, the compromise we got is that we are going to build DC line undersea DC line between Poland and Lithuania, which is much uh, better uh, to be controlled. 
uh, but as you can see, these uh, DC lines uh, under Baltic Sea, they are numerous. So, uh, so uh, there is no uh, uh, energy ring, as it was uh, described years ago, around the uh, uh, sea. But anyway, we are getting, if necessary, we are getting some energy from Sweden, and they are taking some from us if there is no water uh, uh, in uh, Swedish mountains. Uh, and uh, and there are uh, some other linkages. So it looks uh, pretty, pretty well. And we have uh, here you know, just sketch showing you know, interconnections between Polish grid, uh, uh, electrical grid, and uh, neighbors. And uh, it works, you know. Uh, by the way, we are 100% uh, 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 sufficient. I mean, our, our generation is 100% sufficient uh, in supplying uh, Polish uh, demand. So we are not, if we are importing, we are exporting something, you know, it's close to zero uh, uh, every time. Uh, here is gas infrastructure around Baltic. So we are entering, you know, the major point. <laughs> uh, you see this North Stream, I mean first North Stream and second North Stream, you know, the dotted, dotted line. It's not necessarily same, exactly the same routing, but, but anyway, uh, close to. And, uh, and you see the, I mean, uh, Finland is being linked with Estonia. I mean, this is new project, but on the way, Baltic Connector. So, uh, so Estonian uh, system will be linked with, uh, with Finnish system by this undersea connector. This is already agreed, and uh, they started construction. And uh, by the way, uh, they uh, already uh, agreed on a technical level about uh, crossings uh, with the existing uh, 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 pipelines uh, there, which are which is basically first Nord Stream and some other infrastructure, you know, telecommunication and so on. Uh, here on the left side, you see border, Poland, Polish, Lithuanian border, and this is interconnector, which is uh, once again under construction and will be completed by 21. And, uh, and uh, the thin line uh, crossing Poland, this is Yamau section of uh, of uh, uh, Polish, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Polish section of Yamau pipeline. So starting in Belarus, crossing Poland, and, and entering uh, Germany. This is basically, you know, what, what the picture is. This uh, Baltic pipe line and terminal, LNG terminal in Świnoujście, these are our basic uh, projects. Projects, uh, f uh, you know, uh, described in our, in our strategy uh, for diversification. This picture shows uh, Russian pipelines uh, uh, in, in Europe. So this is just the uh, uh, illustration uh, to what uh, uh, Vladimir Sokor was describing, uh, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and others uh, uh, hour ago. Uh, you see, this is, this is what we, what, what we have. The, 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 uh, uh, from the north, uh, this uh, pins, you know, is, uh, the, it are created by Yugal and Opel uh, pipeline in Germany, going down to Czech Republic, Slovakia, and farther down to, to Balkans. And, uh, and uh, there is no Turkish stream on this, on this map, but anyway, because it's farther down to the south. But anyway, we, we can, we can uh, see that this strategy of, uh, of uh, 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 surrounding uh, uh, Central Europe with uh, transmission, big transmission strategic pipelines is almost completed. Mm. And uh, this is what we are trying, you know, to, to, to do. So the uh, alternative routings, alternative uh, routings, and also uh, access to the alternative sources. 
which is Norwegian shelf on the, on the North Sea, and uh, LNG terminal, and this uh, Baltic pipe project, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, it uh, consists of this uh, undersea section, but also it includes this transformation of transmission system inside Poland. Tomasz Stempien, CEO of, uh, from Gas System, will, 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 take, uh, will, will give you some details on that. But anyway, you see the uh, idea is to create third uh, competitive routings for different than Russian gas from north to south because having you know this interconnector to Slovakia uh, actually last week you've been there in Slovakia and they started construction and we started already on our site and it will be completed by 21 uh, so with this interconnector and existing inter interconnector between Slovakia and Hungary will have completely independent uh, uh, way uh, uh, of supply, independent to what's going through Ukraine and independent what's going through Baumgarten in Austria. Of course, volumes are much smaller. And this is what I would like to, to stress. You know, there are not comparable volumes. But anyway, volumes uh, uh, what, what, uh, which they are projected, they already count. Because, for example, the capacity uh, of this interconnector to Slovakia uh, is uh, a bit above 5 BCM yearly. And demand of gas in Slovakia is on a level of 4 BCM yearly. So for such a country like, Slovak uh, like Slovakia, you know, this uh, uh, alternative route means real diversification in case of crisis. We have uh, also on the table plan of, for interconnector to Ukraine with a capacity about 6 BCM. And, uh, uh, okay, this is five here, but it, uh, but it might be, uh, it, it, could be, it could be higher, probably six. And, uh, you see, Ukrainians, they are buying from outside, actually uh, formally from the West, about 11, 12 BCM of gas yearly. So for Ukraine, this five, six BCMs, it could be 50% of uh, uh, import. It makes a difference. It could make difference for them. So this is basically, you know, the the, the idea we are, uh, and the project, the strategic project, we are, to, we are on a way to persuade our colleagues in, uh, in uh, countries uh, south to Poland. And this is part of this uh, 3C initiative, you know. And, and uh, I don't know, it's, this is feasible. I mean, this is not something unlikely. And uh, here you have, uh, just to show you, you know, this uh, competition, because, you know, this is chess game. <laughs> you know, they are, we, are, we are in hurry, they are in hurry. Uh, you know, they are trying to close uh, the area, and we are trying to escape. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, uh, it's like chess, or, or rather probably like go. <laughs> so... So, uh, and we are on a, on a, on a good way to, uh, to really uh, be ready by 22. Uh, everything according to Baltic Pipe Project is going well. And, uh, and we uh, will be able to replace deliveries from the east with deliveries from the, from the north. It would mean that, and now I return to, to to, and this is, you know, this is for, uh, for uh, Thomas Stempin, this. <laughs> uh, and now I return to this problem of, of, of Nord Stream. Because, because you see, the, the thing is that if we succeed, and we are pretty sure that we'll do, with our Baltic Pike project, we will be able to escape from this trap Russian gas trap in Poland. But if they 
are able to proceed with second Nord Stream with uh, this uh, 55 BCM, as was described you know, uh, early morning, coming down north from north to south to those uh, uh, smaller countries uh, south of Poland, it will really uh, stop any idea of uh, diversification for them. So this would be really changing you know, the situation in, uh, uh, in Balkans or Central Europe with uh, probably Poland once again kind of a strange country. You know, we are, uh, <laughs> uh, we are a Slavic country, we learn Latin, we, <laughs> we are Catholic, not Orthodox, uh, it, 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 you know, something in between. <laughs> so probably uh, once again, will be on the right, uh, on the right side. And, and just let me, let me say a few words about, about results of the second or just North Stream. You see, it was, I mean, you touch, you've touched this issue, you know, before, but I would like to stress it once again. It's not, bec it's not about gas deliveries. It's about solidarity. It's about, uh, uh, it's about relations between allies. It's about relations between allies, not only on the EU level, but also on uh, NATO level. Uh, it, would, uh, it would be the beginning of uh, strategic disputes inside the uh, Western community, because uh, uh, you, somebody of you, uh, 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 mentioned that you know uh, that it okay that it was uh, an idea behind the coal and steel community to link uh, uh, you know uh, former adversaries uh, and uh, I mean to link them on an economic level coal and steel production it, they were you know very strategic. Uh, uh, sectors uh, at that time and uh, use it, this cooperation uh, suppressed in a sense uh, uh, on them, cooperation as something which could uh, help uh, to avoid the uh, next war. Uh, the problem is that you, the, you, you, uh, you, met, you said that it could be an idea for cooperation with Ukraine. I don't agree. Ukraine is not the problem. Russia is the problem. And you know what? I, I can imagine that at least some of our partners in Berlin, they may think that the same idea of economic cooperation between, listen, not EU, between Germany and Russia could be the same I mean, similar basis for future prospectus cooperation. Actually, this is what Putin proposed in 2009 being in Poland. He proposed a new axis, Berlin-Moscow axis as the basis for new stage of European cooperation. And uh, this is very dangerous. This is really dangerous because this idea goes beyond Western Hemisphere. It's beyond, goes too far. And this is why we are against. Thank you. Okay, beautiful, dear Piotr. Um, to comment, clarify my comment. What I meant was not that it's a good idea to try to replicate the European coal and steel community today by binding Europe and Russia, or Russia, Ukraine. What I was saying was that if European leaders argue that Ukraine is an unreliable transit state, right, um, and they argue and it's unreliable because, because of its dispute with Russia, um, they, 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 they're calling out their own mistake by saying, okay, well, we can't, we can't now bind ourselves together to you, with Ukraine to try to do the same thing as the European coal and steel community. Why? Because Russia is too dangerous. So what I'm, uh, I'm convoluting this, but anyway, I think it's a contradictory argument. But thank you so much for um, 
providing some, some strategic insight into your own thinking over all these years. It's been a decade and a half that you have been the proponent of Baltic Pipe for this diversification strategy that is often... Um, Already in uh, 1999. 1999, wow. Okay, so 19 years. And unfairly characterized, very, in my mind, very often as some sort of a irrational aversion to any gas molecule that comes from Russia. That's, that's how people who oppose the strategy often criticize it. But what you showed us is a carefully thought out set of strategic threats and steps that hopefully are going to succeed to address those. So I shut up now, but I don't know where, Glenn, are we gonna do, since this was a keynote, questions now to uh, Secretary Naimsky, or should we wait no, until? Can, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Can we? No, please. No, 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 no. <laughs> Okay. Okay, super duper, all right. Yeah. Very happy then, oh good, thank you. Yeah. I was thinking out of respect since he's the keynote speaker, but that's okay, all right. So I'm now pleased to introduce an old friend of mine from my Foreign Service days, Colin Cleary, who I said a few moments ago is the, the new Director for Energy Diplomacy in Europe, Western Hemisphere and Africa, in the State Department's Bureau of Energy Resources. Uh, but he has longstanding uh, experience in Eastern Europe, uh, serving in Poland, uh, serving in Embassy Kiev as our political counselor and our science counselor in our embassy in Moscow. Uh, you can read his, the rest of his assignments here, but Colin, welcome aboard to this, this new assignment, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Matt. And I also want to say on a personal note that Piotr and I know each other from 20 years ago during my uh, uh, previous assignment in Warsaw, so it's great to be reunited uh, with old friends. Seems I am really old. <laughs> no. <laughs> so are we. So um, I'm coming from the Energy Bureau at State, and we are going to be complimented with uh, the Department of Energy. So we'll try and do a, a you know a duo, dynamic duo uh, arrangement for you. I have some prepared remarks, and then you know we can kind of take that uh, on a more question answer thing later if you desire. Uh, a number of the points that we have in our view of my focus will be on the Nord Stream two issue and how it affects the region. Uh, but w our argumentation and our analysis uh, corresponds with much of what we heard earlier today. I mean, there's, there's a real objectivity here when you talk about numbers, and, and that is hard to argue with in many cases. So we, the divergence on some of the interpretations are, are difficult when the numbers really yield uh, particular conclusions. And so uh, I will therefore uh, be um, underlining some of those, some of which we, we heard from our earlier speakers. Uh, there's two, if, if you have, there are two words that I would sort of, when I look at the Nord Stream uh, issue that, that summarize it in two words, it would just be what Piot was just saying, diversification, that it goes against the primary diversification goals of the EU. Uh, and the second thing is Ukraine and the, da the, the tremendous damage it does to a country that's already suffering tremendous strain. So um, one, uh, as far as the diversification goes, one number that I think speaks to it, and we've heard a number of numbers today, uh, was just that um, 11 European countries are dependent on Russia for more than 75% of their gas. So there's a real concentration there. Many of these countries view th this dependence as a national security threat and are working to diversify uh, their energy infrastructure. I will s note that today, uh, in his remarks to the UN, uh, President Trump underlined uh, this issue and, and restated our opposition to Nord Stream. Secretary Pompeo uh, put it the following way in testimony on the Hill on May 23rd. To the extent that the Europeans are dependent or reliant upon Russian energy, it makes their freedom of movement and pushing it back against Moscow more limited. Uh, he continued, uh, we should continue to push the Nord Stream 2 to be ended. We should not increase the dependence that Europe has on Russia. And you know, he, he went on in his testimony on that. But the bottom line there is Europe's reliance on energy, on Russian gas is a strategic vulnerability. While Russia can and should remain a supplier of gas to Europe, it should not be allowed to leverage market dominance to achieve political goals. If completed, Nord Stream 2 would undermine the great strides taken towards Europe, Europe's collective energy security. In particular, Nord Stream 2 would, as it is already doing, uh, divide Europe and strengthen Russia's ability to use its energy resources for political purposes. It would allow Russia to use the pipeline's construction as an excuse to increase its already, we've heard this before, uh, earlier today, its ag aggressive military presence in the Baltic Sea. It would undermine uh, European energy diversification goals and stall critical European energy diversification projects. And it will hurt fundamentally Ukraine's economic and strategic uh, stability by giving Russia the ability, along with Turkish Stream, 
uh, to end or significantly diminish gas transit via Ukraine. Another uh, manifestation, we heard a similar statistic earlier, but Nord Stream 2 would concentrate around two-thirds of EU imports of Russian gas in a single route, creating energy choke point. A disruption along such a route would present uh, security of supply risks for much of the continent. So the numbers really don't lie. Uh, maybe that's why we're hearing uh, similar uh, conclusions. Therefore, why are, why are we having Nord Stream 2? What, there must be some reason for it if the numbers uh, speak otherwise. Well, some advocates will talk, as we heard earlier, I think Matt was uh, uh, noting about a gas import gap, that, they need, that the EU needs uh, Nord Stream to fill a gas import gap especially as uh, Dutch uh, offshore production declines. And, uh, but this is false. It's objectively false. There's, um, for one thing, there's, as we saw, statistically rendered, there is a absolute pipeline overcapacity now. Uh, we heard the number 70% uh, of pipeline utilization. Existing gas pipeline import capacity in the EU already covers even the most extreme estimated increase and gas imports to the EU. So if you, some will say that the demand, as we've heard, may, may not increase or maybe even go down, but even if it were to go up, uh, the current capacity can handle roughly 115 BCM over the next 30 years. There's no need uh, from a capacity standpoint. The second thing is uh, Nord Stream 2, you hear this in Germany, is needed for the German industry, that the industry you know, requires uh, this, this supply. But if you, in fact, Nord Stream 2, the vast majority of the gas will not be consumed in Germany. In fact, uh, our estimates are that at most 10 BCMs would be consumed in Germany and the remaining 45 would be re-exported out of Germany. So that's just f a false, a false uh, statement. And again, there are different estimates of uh, the future gas needs. Some German, the German Industrial Association, BDI, uh, said that German gas uh, demand may actually decline. So there are, other, there are various parameters. But the numbers do not speak for this case. So what is driving Western companies? Well, you know, there's an issue of uh, contracts and other things. It's not, unique, it's not unique to them. It's the same thing with Russia. One of the drivers of Nord Stream, besides the fundamental goal of diverting uh, the, the gas from Poland and undermine, uh, Poland, from Ukraine, and undermining Ukraine, is uh, the fact that these projects support the oligarchic contracts uh, from Kremlin-connected oligarchs. This is, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So our view, in, in short, is that Nord Stream 2 is not a commercial deal, as you hear, but uh, for, for gas from Russia, it's, another, it's an example of the Kremlin's use of Russia's energy resources as a means for gaining course of leverage over Central Europe. It's also a means for co-optation of, of regional elites through uh, contracts and other favors that can be uh, uh, given out. The Baltic countries and others in Central and Eastern Europe uh, know very well that energy is a tool that Russia uses to exert its power and sow discord in the transatlantic community. Uh, it's consistent with Russia's uh, use of hybrid uh, techniques in, through across many spectrums. Now we see it in cyber and many other realms, but energy is, no, is, no, uh, is another aspect of the hybrid toolkit of state power. Uh, and it, and it, along the lines of disinformation and, and the uh, use of of, of information in the support of the gas. There's a tremendous amount of disinformation and distorted conclusions based on uh, the European uh, energy uh, picture and gas and gas problem. The Russian uh, disinformation machine is hard at work. Uh, what happens here then again is the, it, it, and I think Matt talked about this, it, what, you, what you will have effectively is the, through the extension of this project, you have an extension also of the oligarchic uh, basically the state oligarchic system and business practices being extended. <clears throat> uh, the U.S. government welcomed Chancellor Merkel's statement on April 10th, uh, acknowledging the political nature of the project. So whereas it constantly been referred to as strictly a commercial project, uh, some months ago Chancellor Merkel did acknowledge it, the, that there were important political dimensions that she was going to have to address. However, we, we do reject any notion that Nord Stream 2 would be acceptable were Russia to offer as a quid pro quo a guarantee that Gazprom would apply some minimal volume of gas. The number often cited is 30 BCMs, and I think as we heard earlier, uh, there was a question about the, whether the, Ukraine's gas pipeline would be simply used as a swing pipeline, uh, and that the viability of that is very seriously in question. 
So the implications for Ukraine, so you have diversification and Ukraine. Ukraine, a dire, as you've heard from our colleagues, but just to kind of tick off a couple of things, um, Ukraine would lose the leverage that it's hold, that holding Russia back from potentially further aggression. There, uh, the fact that the pipeline does go through Ukrainian territory may be a restraining factor on additional movements. Ukraine would also lose, obviously, substantial gas transit revenues, and those amount to something approaching the uh, Ukrainian defense budget, so the number is a significant number of loss. Going back to the notion of minimal volumes as a potential offset if Nord Stream 2 were to be built, uh, we do not think that a guaranteed arrangement for 30 BCM or any other minimum volume would actually be enforceable. Russia has proven time and again its unreliability as an energy partner in Europe. While it may have, while Germans may feel that their commercial relations are reliable, that's certainly not the case with uh, Ukraine and others. And on a broader level, you can look at the Budapest Memorandum or Gazprom's uh, lack of recognition of the Stockholm Agreement and other, many other examples uh, to, to underline the unreliability of that guarantee. Uh, more recently, the behavior of Russia has, has caused even further concern. We have the uh, use of chemical weapons to poison, uh, poison assassination uh, attempts in England. Um, and, and, and the it obviously intervention in election campaigns in the United States and elsewhere through nefarious means. Uh, now address just the question of, this, there's an issue out there of sanctions that had been alluded to. So when it comes to rec recent US uh, sanctions legislation towards Russia, we cannot lose sight of the fact that aside from responding to Russian meddling in the US election, U.S. sanctions on Russia are linked directly to its attempted annexation of Crimea and its failure to implement the commitments under Minsk and to end its aggression in eastern Ukraine. Recall that the U.S. Congress overwhelmingly last year supported the CATSA, the Countering American Adversaries Through Sanctions Act, and the President signed into law, showing that it takes the Congress and the President together to take Russian interference in our domestic processes very seriously. We've also committed to continue to coordinate with our partners in implementation of the sanctions. While we do not comment on the potential future sanction actions, we have been clear that firms working in the Russian energy export sector are engaging in a line of business that carries elevated sanction risk. The President has stated U.S. opposition Nord Stream 2, including in his public remarks to the White House during the visit, his, the visit of Polish President Duda on September 18th. Their joint statement clearly underscores our position with the, with the quote in the statement. We will continue to coordinate our efforts to counter energy projects that threaten our mutual security, such as Nord Stream 2. We remain steadfast that firms operating in the Russian energy export pipeline sector are operating in a line of business that carries significant sanctions risk. It is worth noting that Danish, the Danish parliament has passed legislation that would give the Danish government the ability to weigh national security concerns in determining whether to authorize the passage of Nord Stream 2 or other pipelines through Denmark's territorial waters. Moreover, Swedish and Latvian officials have denied Nord Stream 2 access to some port infrastructure as staging grounds for pipeline construction. We welcome the efforts of our European partners who are calling for the full application of a third energy package to Nord Stream 2. Nord Stream 2 Oh, there we go. Nord Stream 2 uh, needs to follow Europe's own rules. So I'm, con I'm concluding soon. Uh, the United States cooperates with its European partners and supports many of the projects the EU has identified as projects of common interest that advance Europe's diversification goals. Regarding LNG, some have suggested that the United States sanctions or laws or views on Europe's security simply reflect our desire to sell LNG. And we heard this comment uh, discussed earlier. This is untrue. Our sanctions on Russia, which we worked on to coordinate with the EU, and which cover more than energy, are intended to incentivize Moscow to fully implement its Minsk commitments, to withdraw from Crimea and cease its mal mal malicious cyber activities. Our concerns regarding and, supporting, regarding and support for European energy security go back decades, long before anyone believed the United States would one day be a major LNG exporter. Absent Nord Stream 2, Russian gas could still be exported through a revitalized Ukrainian gas transit op uh, system operating with Western partners under EU law. This would maintain diversity of routes and protect Ukraine. So that's where we should be looking and focusing our efforts. US LNG also provides an important option for Europe as it pursues energy diversification. Finally, just a note on uh, um, 
for, for Germans and others in Europe who talk about the gas, it's true at the point of uh, burning the gas, it's, it's a cleaner fuel than other sources, but it also matters where the gas comes from. Uh, the European public puts a high political premium on green and sustainable energy. Germany in particular has invested billions in renewables, but Russian gas is not produced cleanly or efficiently. Indeed, Gazprom has among the world's worst environment records. Uh, we have very, there are various estimates that say it's produced in a way that uh, generates uh, three to five times uh, the amount of methane leaks, leaks as Norway or other producers. So this at least should enter into the conversation when we're talking about it. To conclude, just, just to summarize to say that we uh, stand in support of the Baltic countries, the, the countries at issue in this conference, Ukraine, Poland, and all the other EU member states who view dependence on Russian gas as a national security threat. We urge all EU member states to join the chorus of nations on both sides of the Atlantic opposing Nord Stream 2. Thanks. Wow. That, yeah. <clears throat> That is a great speech, in my humble opinion, that, uh, wow, Colin, it uh, brings together so many thoughts that we battled over 10, 12 years ago that were highly controversial in the U.S. government. Uh, it was not, you know, it wasn't permitted to say that Gazprom has a predatory uh, approach toward natural gas pipelines or that there's the export of corruption into the political systems of our European allies. Uh, I, I know because I got yelled at many times when I said it publicly, uh, and uh, it's just beautiful to hear, so thank you for that. I just want to clarify, too, that, yeah, I think you said what I said, but that, that I, um, I, I, I firmly agree that there is an excess capacity of Russian experts. Okay, good, good, good. All right, thank you. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Andrea Lockwood, she is the, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Africa, Middle East, Europe, and Eurasia in the Office of International Affairs at DOE. Uh, she's got 31 years of experience at that August agency where she has served as Deputy Director for America's Policy, Senior Advisor to the Secretary for Africa Policy, Lead Analyst on the Middle East, Central Asia, uh, UK and Norway, pretty much everywhere that matters strategically for the US in terms of energy. Uh, I, it, it, in my time at the State Department and at the NSC, uh, it was always crucial for us to figure out how to work together with the DOE to draw on the depth of analytical wisdom uh, in the agency. Uh, so we very much look forward to hearing some of that right now. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for joining and for asking me to join in this very timely uh, discussion. I was with Secretary Perry uh, a week and a half ago in Russia. Uh, he was asked by our ambassador, John Huntsman, to, to go to Russia to uh, reopen a dialogue with the Russians. Uh, but it was a very important exchange because he was very, very clear with the Russian energy minister, uh, with the first deputy prime minister, that, that Russia cannot use energy as an economic weapon, that there is no partnership to be reopened with Russia if, uh, if there are not ways to uh, see more responsible behavior from Russia. He also, of course, reiterated the, the message that you just heard, that we oppose the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, that we do not see it as a commercial pipeline, and that we do not uh, see where all of the countries, as, as the Russians said to us, are united in support of the Nord Stream uh, two pipelines. So this was a position that, that Russia uh, has. They see it as a commercial pipeline that's embraced, uh, and, uh, and we, we really had to uh, disabuse them of that notion. So we, Secretary Perry has been uh, committed to uh, pushing on um, energy security as part of the administration's goals. Uh, and talking to countries, uh, he went from Russia, uh, stopped through to talk about nuclear nonproliferation at the IAEA uh, in Vienna, and then went to the Three C Summit in Bucharest to talk about ways that we can work together to provide uh, options, other options, to over-reliance on, on Russian uh, gas, on Russian electricity, on Russian nuclear power, uh, and a, you know a whole range of diverse options uh, for energy security. Um, 
as my colleague from uh, Poland mentioned. So one of the things that we uh, talked about uh, in Bucharest was a new initiative, um, a, a transatlantic partnership on energy cooperation. And we're very eager to look at with the countries in Central and Eastern Europe on ways that uh, we can strengthen uh, energy access, energy uh, pipelines and routes, and, and factor in LNG as an important option. As, as Colin mentioned, it's obviously not the only option. It's not the uh, we are not just there to sell LNG, but it's certainly the fact that the United States has a significant, has so much energy that we are able to uh, offer it to our partners in Europe provides an important extra way beyond all of the pipelines, and we're certainly supportive of uh, the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, the Kirk LNG Terminal, the, uh, the gas interconnector from Poland and Lithuania, all of the different pipelines that we discussed um, it, as ways to, to bring in pipeline gas from other sources. These interconnections are also important for bringing LNG into uh, Europe as a whole. And, and we will be continuing to work with both the Three Seas Initiative through this new PTEC Initiative, the, the Transatlantic uh, Partnership, and uh, with all of our European partners through the USEU to, to figure out ways to, to strengthen the pipeline infrastructure so that uh, LNG is a viable option uh, and an alternative for all of Europe. The other um, things that the Department of Energy is working on, and, and we see our role as bringing our uh, analytic, our policy, and our technical experts to, to, to build out the, the headlines of what we're talking about so that countries are not um, saying, well, you know, easy for you to say, right? We, we bring our experts over and we say, look, if you, if you expanded this pipeline here, if you put this regulatory and policy structure in place, this will encourage the kind of investment that you're looking to get to diversify your supply base. These are the, these are the choke points, these are the problems that you have. Um, here's the ways that we've addressed these issues in the United States and, and, and structures that we know will bring in investment from U.S. companies. So we'd like to, uh, we continue to enhance our partnerships with our energy ministry colleagues and, and the Secretary of Energy and Deputy Secretary Buyet, Under Secretary uh, Mark Menzies have all been very uh, articulate and effective advocates for the administration on this. We are, uh, on nuclear energy, you know, one of the problems that isn't uh, as well uh, talked about is that most countries are also dependent on Russian nuclear uh, supplies, and these Tavel reactors that are all along the periphery countries were set up to to uh, only use Russian nuclear fuel, and in fact, Russia, similar in the in the case of natural gas, put out a whole campaign saying that if you put Westinghouse fuel or uh, GE fuel into these uh, reactors, they would break. They wouldn't work. So what we did in Ukraine is we did a demonstration project to demonstrate that in fact you could use uh, Western-based fuel in these nuclear reactors and they would not break. And, and that's something that we've offered to other uh, countries within the Baltic sphere as they look at uh, the need to uh, increase their, their nuclear capacity. And, and we're very excited about uh, working with Poland on in, in uh, looking at increasing its uh, access to nuclear generated electricity. We, um, on, on the, um, electricity grids uh, that was mentioned, we are also uh, working together with our department partners at state and also the Department of Defense because uh, grid access is really important to uh, keeping national security uh, as well as energy security in, in the region. Uh, we're looking at ways to enhance these uh, these grid interconnections and the, the desynchronization from Russia and the synchronization to the West, making sure that things like uh, the nuclear power from um, the uh, region just 
next to the Baltic countries is, is not uh, finding access and revenue through those grids. So, so we've had policy experts on the ground. We've had uh, ec electricity experts from uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratories also come uh, out to talk to Baltic leaders about you know, how do we enhance uh, the grids? And, and when you're enhancing the grids, you also want to look at the uh, concerns about cybersecurity, which is something that uh, the Department of Energy uh, leads the electricity cybersecurity uh, response teams for the electricity sector in the U.S. And, and our companies uh, and our grid learns a lot from looking at what are the potential threats um, that are happening right on the Russian periphery. So there are a number of ways that uh, the Department of Energy uh, is a uh, important partner in this effort, and uh, and we also uh, extend that to be working with our private sector companies to understand how uh, the tools of the department and the national labs can uh, partner with uh, the efforts of the Department of State and the Department of Defense, the White House, and across the government to, to really make sure we have a, a comprehensive, pragmatic, and well thought out answer to, to uh, what the Russians are offering uh, in, in this uh, market. So that basically sums up what I have to say. Thank you so much. And again, more great news of uh, uh, strategic vision and sophistication. I don't mean to sound in any way sort of uh, you know, deprecating, but really a, a, such a high level of strategic sophistication that goes well beyond anything we were talking about 10, 12 years ago, getting to the nitty gritty of uh, grid protection and access and cyber threats and, and, and all the other things, which gets us right to Edward Lucas, who is an expert on anything that people in this room care about, I think you could say, uh, including cybersecurity, uh, on which he's written a book, a couple of books, in fact. Uh, back where I used to spend a lot of time in Estonia, I mean, Edward is seen as, yeah, one of the, the, the sharpest thinkers on cybersecurity, yet I got to know you through energy security. The first time I met you was at a, a conference about Nord Stream 1 and Baltic secu energy security in Riga. And, uh, I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, who is this guy? I mean, boy, I, I seem, it seems like we are clones in the way we think about this, and there were few that were. Uh, he became, he was a senior editor at The Economist, and I, I presume it was you who wrote a, an article I'll never forget. You were very kind to me about uh, that conference and uh, the former Commissioner Peebles and the need for the transatlantic community to come together and show the same solidarity we've been talking about all morning. So I'll shut up here in a second and just, just add, though, Edward, a couple, of, a couple of years ago when we were either in Stockholm or Tallinn, you said, well, I think a lot of the, the key strategic questions on energy security in Northeast Europe have been answered with the diversification plans of the European Union. Um, I wonder if you're going to tell us that your thoughts have changed. I hope not. I hope you remain uh, comfortable and sanguine. Uh, but we're turning it to you, as it says, as commentator. But please speak about anything you wish. Thank you. Well, thanks very much indeed, Matt. And I... I'm in a difficult position here because I basically agree with everything that everybody said, and so it'd be boring just to re repeat, repeat it all. Um, so I'll try and um, in, in introduce a few notes of, of, of controversy. But I think the first point, which is really important, is, is that we are having this discussion 10 or 15 years too late. Um, these fundamentally are problems of our own making, and that's true of everything to do with Russia. Again and again, Russia wins because Russia <coughs> thinks Long term, Russia thinks um, it's willing to take risks, it's willing to spend money, and it's willing to lie about what it does, and we are always playing catch up, and we're playing catch up now. We played catch up with Nord Stream 1, we're playing catch up now with Nord Stream 2. When we do start playing catch up, we're usually quite good at it, and I think um, it hasn't been said explicitly here, so I just want to say that I do think that the European Commission really deserves more praise than it got, certainly than it got in, in my country for the third energy package and for the prosecution of Gazprom. Um, this wasn't the state through the heart of the vampire, but it was certainly plenty of cloves of garlic spread all, 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 all over Europe. And people didn't believe that was going to happen. They didn't believe that you would be able to have what the EU calls dawn raids, which is very civilized. It's sort of 10 o'clock and a door, doorbell rather than actually kicking the place down. But they seized documents and computers and they 
produced the complaint and they brought Gazprom to the table, which was a big surprise to Gazprom, just as it was a big surprise to Google and Microsoft and other big companies that didn't take EU competition seriously. And as uh, Piotr said, we have had um, really important progress on the north-south gas grid. We also have storage, which we were very weak on 10, 15 years ago. That's why those supply interruptions through Ukraine were so damaging, because we didn't have buffers in the system. We have much better data than we did. So we've done, we, we were doing pretty well, but I think we should see Nord Stream 2 really as a kind of Russian counter-strike against our counter-strike. I'm very intrigued by this idea of are we playing chess or go, and I sort of wonder if it's neither of those. I think maybe poker. And I think there's an element of bluff here that as the Russians think we're not serious, they think that when it comes to the crunch, the US administration is not going to put sanctions on, America, on, on German energy companies or on the banks that are um, financing this, that in the end the US-German relationship is under um, a lot of strain anyway because of 2% and because of the president's views of Mrs. Merkel and Mrs. Merkel's views of the president and so on. And that this is the United States is not fundamentally going to put a really major extra burden on that relationship by throwing all its um, its chips onto the um, the stop Nord Stream thing. I don't know whether that's true or not. I'm I think predicting American foreign policy, particularly at the moment, is not 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 a good game to um, to get into. I prefer to write about it than than, than predict it. Um, but I can certainly see, some, see, see some, some difficulties. And I think the Russians have done a very good job, as usual, in shaping German public opinion on this. And if you talk to Germans, they say what this is really about is that American chemical companies get really cheap gas thanks to shale, and they want to stop us getting cheap Russian gas because it will be good for their market share. So it's been portrayed as, as basically a kind of mercantilist um, uh, approach by the Americans. In fact, as you quite rightly pointed out, America was, the United States was saying this before anybody had ever thought that you could exp um, get unconventional gas in large amounts out of the ground, let alone um, liquefy it and send it, send it halfway around the world. But that, that perception has been baked into German public opinion, and if the United States is really going to go um, into, the, into the trenches on this, it will be, um, it, it, the, the, the political cost is, is quite high. I think we also need just to bear a bit more in mind, I'm glad you mentioned the, um, the, the green side of this and the extremely dirty way in which Russia produces um, its, its natural gas. But I think we're moving into an era of new energy systems, both with the pressure for decarbonization and all sorts of other changes that are happening in the, um, in the electricity grid. And we need to be careful that our thinking on this is properly, is properly future-proofed. Um, and I think it's a particularly, a particularly an issue for, for Poland with its, gen with its coal heavy um, generation, how that's going to work in, a, in an era of where, where there's strong public pressure for decarbonization, and that will change the thing a bit. Um, we also haven't really mentioned indigenous gas, and I've just come back from Ukraine. I was at the um, Ukraine Financial Forum in Odessa talking about energy. And one of the really striking things about this is that, um, and actually this is partly true of, of Poland as well, but it's particularly true of Ukraine, there are substantial indigenous gas resources that have been um, rather, the, the, uh, the cheap Russian pipeline gas has kind of strangled their development. That's leaving aside the possibility of, 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 of shale. Um, Ukraine's, because of the collapse in demand in Ukraine, um, because of the recession and the war, um, Ukraine, as we know, doesn't Im import Russian, uh, Russian gas. Actually, there are people who say that Ukraine wouldn't need to import any gas at all if it developed its own um, energy resources. It's a striking tribute to the um, very incompetent and corrupt way in which Ukraine has organized its gas licensing, that far from having its exploration licensing, that far from having um, foreign energy companies queuing up to try and export, uh, to, 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 to get going on the indigenous gas, they've actually been forming a queue to, to leave. And that's been, that's been a, a, a long, sad story. But it could change. And there's very encouraging new things happening using the Ukrainians, using their e-procurement system, Prozor, as a way of um, dealing with the um, applications for indigenous gas. So that could be a game changer, particularly if, um, if the pricing structure is right and the re rewards, rewards are there. We also haven't really talked about the legal side. And I think that I, I would love to hear a bit more about what... Um, that is in the third energy package and in e EU law generally to try and throw spanners in the works on, um, on Nord Stream 2 or particularly to try and constrain the way in which the gas is 
um, sold and distributed through Europe. And I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested, and perhaps um, Piotr would like to mention this, I thought that when the Commission came out with, its, with the complaint and the judgment that showed that Gazprom had been systematically overcharging its um, customers in the, what we used to call the new member states um, of the EU, um, Professor Alan Riley, a friend of mine known to many people in this, this room, said, well, this is a great chance. You should sue them. You should sue them for all the overpayment that you've made since 2004, and they should pay you back. They were overcharging you. And I was disappointed that none of the um, countries that had been overcharged wanted to do that. But I think that if we think strategically about this, there are legal, and we can use both the um, civil courts but also enforcement mechanisms to try and um, th um, uh, do um, d put push back a bit on that. And then finally, and this is a very provocative point, but it was said to me by a Ukrainian, so I'm just kind of channeling what my, he said, who said, if you look back over the last, you know, since 1991, we've had tens of billions of dollars in um, transit revenues. And those tens of billions of dollars in transit revenues have not gone for modernizing the gas grid. They have not gone for financing the reform of Ukrainian infrastructure and public services. They have not really gone on anything except the erection of an extremely corrupt political system because free money is basically bad. When you have free money, it creates rents. We have rents, you get corruption. So this Ukrainian friend of mine said it will be a very big hit for us in the short term um, if we lose two, three billion a year. Indeed, that's about the size of our defense budget. But it will actually drive a stake through the dark heart of the kind of political energy complex where politicians judge their success by whether they can get access to these transit revenues. Now, I think that's probably a bit too harsh, and I'm impressed by the way in which Ukraine has been um, reforming since 2014. I think there is at least a chance that we get an energy s system in Ukraine that is, is, is pretty transparent and where these transit revenues would actually be um, the source of much needed modernization, because as we know, the pipes and compressors are all worn out and leaky, and there's a great deal of, of, of need. But I think that it, there, is, there is a balance, and it's, it's possible that maybe as a result, if, if these transit revenues go, um, that that will actually have the same effect as it would on Russia if the oil and gas revenue stopped flowing in Russia. It would force people to find an, an honest living. Now, I'm really sorry. I'm going to um, have to leave in about two minutes. I have a meeting at 2 o'clock, which is about 20 minutes away. Um, I can be a little bit late for it, but not more. But I ha thank you so much for having me, and I'm happy to chuck these rocks into the pool and hope to see some ripples um, <laughs> breaking on the shore. Thanks so much, Edward, for <coughs> ending on such a, an optimistic yet realistic note uh, and recalling for us, as we talked about in the earlier session, uh, what a vulnerability Ukraine's incredibly non-transparent natural gas sector was, how the reforms are helping to, to get things on a better track, but then, yeah, denying these, these rent-seeking opportunities could actually be bitter medicine that's needed. Um, as Edward runs out the door, does anybody want to shout a question at him? He can, he can holler back as he, as he goes down the stairs. Yeah, Margarita. I would like to comment. Oh, 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 I, oh, and okay, yes, please. Thank you, uh, Margarita Sanova. What is the upshot? What can be done uh, to stop Nord Stream Two, in, in terms of legal um, measures, in terms of sanctions? Do you see uh, anything immediate? I don't see Germany quitting, giving it up. So, what is the upshot? And if I, so that's a perfect question because it was actually passed by Edward to Piotr, and Piotr wanted to comment on what Edward just had to say. So, so I'll just say, excellent question, and I look forward to Piotr's answer, and I'm going to um, love you and leave you at that point. It was a pleasure meeting you. All right, very nice to meet you. No, uh, if I may, I just wanted to uh, to, to to comment uh, uh, what our friend said about uh, about Ukrainian gas sector and uh, and uh, transparency of this promising transparency of this gas sector. Or uh, so, uh, unfortunately, I am not so optimistic about that. Uh, we are uh, we are struggling there 
trying to persuade Ukrainians uh, to reorganize uh, this sector, to, uh, to reorganize it according to European legislation, to proceed with unbundling. And there is uh, very hard to find out who is in charge there, whether it is uh, Naftogaz management, whether this is Ministry of Energy, whether this is Presidential Chancellery, whether it is Uktransgas, uh, uh, which is the owner of the transmission, transmission grid formally. And, uh, uh, and uh, we, as I mentioned, we have on the table this uh, uh, interconnector to Ukraine. This is a question of decision on Ukrainian side. Uh, and uh, there is no decision about construction of this uh, 100 kilometers uh, uh, needed uh, pipeline. Uh, so, uh, so it's not so, so easy. And the second point I would like to say is, uh, is uh, related to, to his comment on, on uh, silence from, uh, uh, from uh, affected countries uh, by, by Gazprom. Uh, you see, the thing is, I, I, I may say something about, about Poland, about Polish POGC, which is uh, Peginik. So Peginik is uh, in the Stockholm cart with, uh, with Gazprom, and uh, it's uh, on a good way to win the case uh, in Stockholm, uh, the same way as uh, uh, Ukrainians, uh, uh, Ukrainian NAFTA has uh, won. The problem is that Ukrainians won the case and they are not able to extract those money. <laughs> so, so you see, the, this is a, a, a bit tricky. And if I may say one thing extra, may I? I would like, because we got the news that uh, about a statement, part of the statement by, uh, made by uh, President Trump uh, at New York today, uh, is related to UN uh, uh, assembly that he said that uh, that he supports uh, uh, I mean he's not un he, he doesn't understand reliance on one supplier uh -huh. and uh, he supports uh, efforts by uh, countries who are trying to change the situation specifically Poland uh, uh, going to construct Baltic pipes, so pipes or connection with uh, Norwegian field. I really, we really appreciate it. Specifically, that President Trump is uh, supporting our pipeline part of our strategy, not on the LNG. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent point. Yeah, that undercuts the Russian argument that all he cares about is U.S. LNG. Margarita, you got only a partial answer, yeah, which uh, Piotr saying that there was the, the decision of the European court that, that can't really be enforced. Does anybody else want to comment on any of the other EU tools? I mean, we have two U.S. officials and one EU official, but maybe any, anything else? Yeah, or you, okay, yeah. Are U.S., other U.S. legal or political tools that could be helpful in dissuading Germany from proceeding with Nord Stream 2? Well, I mean, uh, my remarks referenced uh, the CATSA legislation, so that's a tool that could potentially be employed here. The, there's been no decisions made on that, but it is, it is there. Hopefully, hopefully uh, companies concerned will take a look at the risk factor and factor that into their calculations. When Secretary Perry was in Russia, one of the questions that he got from the uh, press was, will the CATSA uh, sanctions be extended to Nord Stream 2? He, is it possible that they could be, was the question. And he said, it's always possible. So, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, there are a number of companies who are in contracts uh, right now that, uh, you know, are looking to see if there are uh, ways that uh, that they can get out of those contracts, and and at this point, uh, you know, uh, sanctions are a tool.
particularly since they're working on the Russian side with two individuals who, and their companies which are under sanctions currently, Gennady Timchenko and uh, the banker Rothenberg, they are w building the Russian pipe, the Russian side of the pipe. I've been raising this because I kind of want to focus a little bit more attention to a very easy tool. Any company working with a sanctioned company mm. could be put under sanctions too. And very easily, uh, there is no need to, of, of a law. Um, I know there are four projects, four proposals uh, in the, on a the hill right now for sanctions on uh, Nord Stream 2, and uh, they might go forward, uh, at least some of them. But this is a very easy mechanism that we don't seem to be using. And we used it on South Stream in Bulgaria. Excellent point. We are exactly on time, but uh, we, that means we have a little time too. If anybody wants to ask another question, we could have a couple fewer minutes of coffee, just in case. Please. Uh, I'm Volodymyr Dubovic uh, from uh, Odessa University, Ukraine, and it's good to see Colin Cleary, my Nagas. We've met when you were based and deployed to Ukraine a couple of times. Um, uh, my country has obviously been mentioned <laughs> on previous panel and now as well. Um, I wonder if uh, we are trying to see the argument that is uh, Nord Stream 2 is not fair to Ukraine uh, as a main argument of opposing uh, its construction, that it might just not work, that it might not be convincing to a lot of countries and public and political elites, not to mention business elites. I mean, uh, in Germany, for instance, uh, you can definitely see corporations and public saying, so what, it's bad for Ukraine, but I mean, we're going to help Ukraine anyway. We're going to provide some assistance, but the Nord Stream is good for us. You know, it's a direct thing. It's coming straight from Russia. Russia is not an enemy. It's not a Cold War. So what's, what's wrong with it? I mean, so to me, I think uh, it would be more uh, appropriate and maybe viable, effective, uh, too, if uh, we come up with some economic uh, uh, arguments of economic nature. Why is it bad? for economy of the region, of certain countries, groups of countries, and not just focus on Ukraine, because I think, actually, frankly, a lot of people in Europe and here across the ocean as well in the US are being tired already of hearing for four plus years about, oh, Ukrainians suffer so much. Yes, we do, and we appreciate the support, but it just not, might not cut it as a main argument. Oh, look at Ukraine, they're gonna lose it bad. They're gonna lose it big, and we will. But I mean, in terms of convincing the public across the board in various countries and regions, it just might not work. I wonder what you think about that. Thank you. Okay, thank, nice to see you again. Uh, I would say the diversification argument is fundamentally, is, is much broader than just Ukraine. So I mean, that's, I, I was talking about two things as my key points, the, the diversification and Ukraine, but diversification is the entire network that Piot was outlining, these, these efforts and that the European Commission and others have devoted enormous work to. So this is a, and, and I think um, Matt Breiza also was referencing the fact that it, the Nord Stream 2 goes against really the fundamental principles outlined in, in, in the EU about diversification. So that should carry weight. Uh, that's a lot of what actually President um, Trump was, was sent, talking today, really, about the diversification side. Uh, that said, um, the United States is strongly in favor of the territorial integrity of Ukraine, and uh, this thing is taking place in the context of uh, annexation of Ukrainian territory and a war that's still going on in the East, and uh, that can't be denied, and the fact that the effect on Ukraine would be uh, very harmful and so we're, mind, we're mindful of that as well. I, whether it persuades everyone, uh, it certainly persuades uh, when Congress uh, votes, not just on this matter uh, for this reason, but so overwhelmingly, there's a lot of people that are persuaded, at least in, in, in our country. And I know in Poland, perhaps Piotr can affirm this, uh, it's, it's felt strongly uh, in many countries in Europe and that in fact, uh, those who support the pipeline are in the minority. And, and speaking as an economist, it is not an economic pipeline. I mean, one of the things that Colin mentioned is that uh, the pipeline capacity, there's, there's more than enough. Uh, and it also, um, 
costs more to build a new pipeline than it does to repair one, uh, even if you argue that the, the current uh, pipeline structure needs uh, upgrading. So the, uh, when we ran the numbers, uh, it, it is not an economic pipeline. And, and there, is, uh, there are other ways to bring additional gas that provide both the diversity that he mentioned and the uh, uh, and use existing infrastructure as opposed to, to building a new one. So that is an argument that uh, certainly um, Secretary Perry has been making and, and one that resonates, I think, with, with everybody outside of Germany because, indeed, you know, the Germans are going to get a, a lower price uh, into their market, and, and the Russians have offered, uh, you know, incentive pricing. And that's the other... Um, thing that, that we are trying to make very, very clear is that gas should be priced due to its cost, not uh, in some kind of a loss leader fashion that, that makes it more attractive every time you open a new pipeline. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully Commissioner Versteger is listening and will follow up on opposing the state aid from Russia. Last question, Mr. Sokor. It's more of a comment than a question. I agree with uh, what the State Department representative said. I agree entirely. About Ukrainian transit, I'd like to make clear that we said in our panel that Ukraine is not a central or a core issue in this debate. Without trying to minimize it, it is, in terms of Nord Stream, a collateral issue. Uh, Maintaining transit volumes through the Ukrainian system cannot be an excuse for proceeding with Nord Stream. Um, ensuring Ukrainian transit does not mitigate the negative consequences of Nord Stream. We focused our arguments on economics, as the State Department representatives rightly said, but also as a central element on European legislation, European solidarity, and Germany's position as the largest economy in the European Union, undermining, even destroying, the achievements of the European Union's integrated energy market and the third legislative package. That is the core argument, and that should be the avenue pursued in Europe in order to gain maximum, broadest support for the anti-Nord Stream argument. It is a European argument, and that can gain allies for us. Thank you.